This video was sponsored by Squarespace. From websites and online stores to marketing tools and analytics, Squarespace is the all-in-one platform to build a beautiful online presence and run your business. Hey, in this video, I'll show you how I build this little shelving unit behind me and how I do it in less than five days with the help of a good friend of mine, Keith Johnson. Well, he was a good friend of mine until this five day build. You'll see what I mean. Roll the footage. Guy's probably never gonna talk to me again. I'm gonna call Keith, see if I can rope him into coming out here. Oh, that's a hard pass. That's weird. That guy loves me. Hmm. Try again. Oh, he'll keep calling me. Calling me. I'm just gonna keep calling. Mothman! What's up, buddy? Hey, <laughs> I'm good, man. Good, good. Hey, so I got this little project coming up. Uh huh. The simple shelving unit, really, but it's kind of awkward. I need some help lifting it. I was hoping maybe you could come out. Uh, yeah, kind of got some stuff going on, but. If you don't think it'll take that long. Yeah, but like maybe a day, two max. Like I said, it's not that crazy. Simple shelving unit. Okay. All right, I'll be right over. All right, bye. Here we go again. <laughs> I can't believe he fell for it again. <laughs> You would think that Keith would know enough by now that when I say little project, I might not be telling the whole truth. He came out, looked at that wall, and got pretty upset. He was flailing his arms around like Coco the monkey. But I talked him off the ledge, convinced him to stick around for the build of his life. Meaning this might be the last build of his life. There's a good chance that this wall's gonna kill us both. Day one. Now the first thing I needed to do was bring Keith up to speed on the design. About that design. Now I've never actually built a built-in this large in my entire life. So I tried to design this in a very specific way to eliminate the need for an upper face frame altogether. You'll see what I mean by that as we get going in the build. The first thing we had to do was make a cut list and just start ripping down sheets of plywood. Because between you and me, there were a lot of sheets of plywood. I actually had to take out a second mortgage on my house just to pay for said plywood. And then we started cutting those beautiful sheets into little pieces. But that's woodworking for you. We decided to start with the bottom three base cabinets. That's right, the bottom is gonna be made up of three units that will come together to make one seamless base unit. That base unit will be made up entirely of drawers with a solid oak countertop and all the shelves will sit upon it. So we cut down all the side pieces for our base cabinets, we cut out the bottoms, and we cut out some smaller strips that'll make up the toe kick. It was about that time that we realized if we're gonna get this thing done in four and a half days, we should probably get that solid oak slab glued up so we can you know, let the glue dry and work on it progressively as we build the rest of the cabinet. There was just one small issue. The length of these boards to start with was 16 feet. We chopped them down to just over 14 feet and they were still too long to run through my table saw. So we went on to plan B. Plan B was to grab my contractor saw that we could set up in the middle of the shop and run them through that. But there was another problem. I hadn't used this in years and it turns out my fence was completely busted. I was just about to suggest throwing some duct tape on it and using it anyways when I remembered, oh yeah, I actually have a third table saw. The reason I didn't think of this to begin with is because normally I have it set up with a dado stack. 
but we just took the dado stack out, put a regular saw blade in, and what do you know, we had just enough clearance when Keith lifted up the boards to run those 14 footers through and get a nice straight edge on both sides. We clamped them together to make sure they didn't need any joining. That would be fun. And luckily enough, they were good to go. So because the boards were so long, we decided to put some dominoes in between each board simply for alignment to make the glue up a lot easier. And Keith stared at the camera. I invented staring at the camera, Keith. That's my thing. Once our boards were somewhat milled up and all mortised out for our dominoes, I started spreading glue in between each joint and Keith came behind me and plopped in some dominoes. Keith also liked to make fun of me during this entire build for the amount of times I used the phrase plopped. Like I plopped this into place, I plopped that into place, we just gotta plop that over there. Hey, plopped is a good word and I'm gonna use the hell out of it. So just step off, Keith. With all of our dominoes plopped into place, we clamped our board sufficiently, and this is where I almost died. Now if you don't think you can die from a rogue clamp, just watch this. That's right, it was right here where one of the clamps came unclamped due to the pressure flung backwards and almost hit me right in the face. So forgive me, but I did slip a curse word. That's exactly why I usually remove those rubber feet on my clamps, because once they come under pressure, that rubber foot can slip and whammo. So with our oak top all glued up, we set it aside to dry, I changed my shorts, and we started taking all those pieces of plywood that we previously cut for our base units and hooking them together. And because of the sheer size of this built-in, we decided to just go fast and dirty, and that was to just glue and screw everything together. It was gonna be sandwiched between two walls, so I had no doubt that it was gonna be plenty strong. Now, other than the simple glue and screw method, I'm building these cabinet boxes pretty much identical to the way I build all my cabinet boxes. And if you want a more detailed look at exactly how I do that, there's another video on my YouTube channel showing you my step-by-step -step process. But for this, we just put a little glue on each piece, tacked it in place to hold it, and then came back and sank in some screws for that added strength. As I mentioned, with this entire thing being wedged between two walls, it's not gonna go anywhere. After getting one box done, well, we did the exact same thing to two duplicate boxes until we had all three of our base cabinet carcasses complete. And then for some weird reason, we stacked them on top of each other. This is not at all how they're gonna be oriented. I just think we were having fun and got a little ahead of ourselves and wanted to stack things. Anyways, this is where we were after getting all of our base cabinets put together. Except remember, they're not going to be stacked on top of each other. Next, we needed to make the face frames for our lower cabinets. So I started rough cutting up some poplar and Keith started running it through the joiner to get a nice straight edge. Then we ran everything through the table saw to the correct width for all the parts and pieces for our face frame. This took a while because there was three face frames and we're gonna have 18 drawers in total in these three boxes. So yeah, that's a lot of pieces. After cutting them down on the table saw to width, I cut them to their final dimension over on the chop saw and I set Keith to work drilling out a zillion pocket holes in all of our pieces so that we could hook our face frames together. And I gotta tell you, it is really nice having someone else in the shop to drill all the pocket holes. I hate this part, but someone's got to do it. And luckily that someone just happened to be Keith. With all of our pieces ready for our face frames to go together, we needed a place to actually put our face frames together. And there was a big oak slab in the way. So we took all the clamps off, the glue now was sufficiently dry, and we set that out of the way to come back to at a later time. Then we brought all of the pieces for our face frames over to my work surface, and started laying them out. Now the easiest way to put face frames together is to figure out all of your openings and spacing and just cut a few scrap spacer blocks apply. That way you can plop those spacer blocks in between your pieces and get everything spaced out nice and evenly. 
Again, having two sets of hands to do this simple task made it go crazy quick. Keith inserted the pocket screws, I added the glue, and then we took turns, you know, screwing the screws into place. Because neither one of us wanted to hog all the fun. The nice thing about these three face frames is they're all identical. And not only is each one identical, each drawer spacing is identical. So they actually went together pretty quick, and in no time we had three face frames to really jazz up those base cabinets. And we were still on day one, and it was still light outside. So now that our face frames were done for our lower cabinets, we could figure out the size of our drawer faces and start getting those prepped. So I rough cut more pieces of poplar and Keith went back over to the joiner and got a nice square straight edge on one side. Well, he did take a few breaks to fill up his mug with a little cold brew from the fridge, but he was still working fairly hard. With all of our pieces rough cut to length and squared up, we started running them through the table saw to bring them to our final width, which was two and a quarter inches wide. Then we could cut all of our pieces down to their final and accurate length. This took a while because 18 drawers with four pieces each, that's 18 times four. Correct me if I'm wrong, but that's 72 individual pieces we had to cut down for these drawers. After we got them all cut to size, I started sending them through the table saw, first on one side, then flipping it around and doing it again on the other side, putting a perfectly centered quarter inch groove down the middle of each one of those pieces. This groove will make the perfect home for our floating panels to sit inside of our shaker style drawer faces. So I just kept going and going and going. 72 pieces, ran through the table saw twice, correct me if I'm wrong, but that's 144 passes through the table saw to get a groove down the middle of all of these pieces. While I was doing that, Keith was setting up the dado saw with the Rockler crosscut sled to cut out the matching tenants. He really wanted to show the camera how well these fit, and I really wanted him to get the heck out of the way so we could actually cut the tenons and move on with the project. It was almost the end of day one, and my dogs were biting. So, I started running the pieces through the Rockler crosscut sled, cutting those perfect tenons, and handing each piece to Keith. Keith then took all the pieces, assembled them together into a frame to make sure we had the right amount. And by the end of day one, we had our lower cabinets done, face frame included, our oak slab glued up, and all of the frames for our drawer faces fit together. Day two. On the morning of day two, we came out to the shop, bright-eyed and bushy-tailed, and decided to keep working on that oak slab we glued up the day before. So the first thing we did was cut it to the correct width. The nice thing about this was by cutting it down, we were able to then send it through my planer. Just a light pass on both sides to get rid of all of our glue seams and make that puppy really shine. This might be the biggest thing I've ever sent through the planer, and I sure was glad to have my buddy Keith there to help me. Then we took the piece that we originally cut off and decided to glue it back on. No, not because we made a mistake, because we wanted to bring up the thickness of the overall slab to an inch and a half rather than three quarter. So by gluing this piece on the front, we could trick people into thinking a three quarter inch thick slab was really an inch and a half thick. Ha ha, fooled you. So I just grabbed a couple clamps, we spread some glue on that piece, and we clamped it securely in place. At least, I hope we have enough clamps. While we waited for that to dry, we decided to finish the drawer faces that we started the previous day. The next thing we needed to do was cut down the panels that we would float in between our frames that we dry fit yesterday. Now normally, I would use a half inch panel that I would wrap it out so that it was flush on the back and inset on the front. But when we went to the lumber store, they were completely out of half inch MDF. So we had to settle for quarter inch which means that when we go to hook these to our drawer boxes, we're gonna have to stick some sort of spacer on the back to make up for that void. But we didn't let that slow us down. We got a little assembly line going and in no time we had all 18 of our drawer faces glued up and in clamps. And we were ready to go back over to that oak top. By now the glue was dry on our false front, so I made Keith take a phone break apparently. What the heck man, get to work. 
I made Keith take all the clamps off, and once those were removed, I grabbed my router with a flush trim bit, and I made sure that front edge was nice and smooth. Just like Keith's baby face. Do you know that he doesn't even shave? His face is just naturally hairless, like a naked mole rat. Weird. With our oak top pretty much ready to go and our drawer faces all glued up, it was finally time to start cutting down plywood for our upper cabinets. And there were a lot of them. Shelves upon shelves upon shelves, as far as the eye could see. So we started ripping down plywood like beavers at an all-you-can-eat buffet. That doesn't really make a lot of sense, but it's the best I got. My point is we ripped down a large quantity of plywood. And then once we ripped it down to the correct width, we had to cut it down to the correct length. And the real bummer is that our shelves were 50 inches wide, which meant that we had a lot of waste left over from our 4 by 8 sheets of plywood. But that's okay. I'm sure I'll find something to do with all those small offcuts of three quarter inch birch ply. Like maybe build a normal size built in. Now because we're gonna be gluing and screwing the upper cabinets together just like we did the lower, we needed a mark on the outside of each side piece exactly where our shelves would land so that when we sent our nails and or screws in through the outside, we wouldn't miss the shelf. So we made a little setup block Keith marked out all of the shelf locations, and then we started plopping our pieces together. We just use our little spacer block, add a little glue, put in a piece, tack it in place, and then come back and screw the entire thing together once it was held firm with the 16 gauge nailer. We developed a little system where we'd do one side completely and then flip it around and do the other side. We had to do this on my outfeed table on the table saw because all of our other work surfaces were covered with either material or things that were drying. We also put a few feet on the bottom of these cabinets so we wouldn't mar up the veneered plywood when we were moving it around. And, well, we got the hang of it after a while and pretty soon we had all six, that's right, six of our upper shelf units hooked together. Yeah. I said six. What the heck are we building? The Taj Mahal flipping hall? Now you might notice that our upper shelving units are backless. Not like backless like a classy prom dress, but backless as in they don't have plywood backers on them. Now normally the way I build cabinets is I do a dadoed groove and I slide in the plywood backer and it's a quarter inch thick. But Keith brought up a good point that if we just slap a piece of half inch on the back, we can screw it in place. This will help us make sure that each cabinet is perfectly square and because the half inch is thick enough, we can really anchor the cabinet to the wall anywhere we want. Now in order to get the width for our plywood backs, we needed to use half inch Baltic birch ply because it comes in a five by five sheet. And of course to get the length, we needed to use multiple pieces. So we cut down our first piece, making sure that the seam would land right behind one of the shelves so that you wouldn't see that seam on the front side. Then we got it all squared up with a little glue, tacked it in place, and then of course we came back, pre-drilled with a countersink bit, and screwed that puppy in until it was locked down nice and strong. Once we got the upper portion of the cabinet done, I added some more glue to the lower portion, and we added just a little baby piece get our last little bit of coverage. And of course we tacked that down and screwed it in place. One upper cabinet completely put together and five more to go. How is that even possible? Where are these things gonna fit? Little twirl from the camera and on to number two. Now all of our upper shelving units were assembled pretty much identically with the exception of one and that was our middle shelving unit on the bottom. And that's because this is where I plan to put a TV. So I wanted to construct it a little bit differently so the TV wasn't hanging pushed to the back of the cabinet and in shadow all the time. So my plan for this was to bump out the panel on that middle section to kind of create a false front that the TV could hang on. This would move the TV to the front of the cabinet and also create a void behind it that I could funnel cords down to the lower shelf. 
So we just built a little frame out of some scrap fascia board, of all things, that I had laying around the outside of my shop. And then we cut a perfect piece of half inch Baltic birch, inserted it in on top of that wooden frame, and we screwed it in place. And because I'm gonna be mounting a TV to this, I wanted it to be a little thicker than half inch. So after we screwed the first piece of half inch ply in place, I squirted a whole bunch of glue on the back side of another piece, and we stuck this one on the top. Now for this, we just tacked it in place with a few 18 gauge brad nails because that way we can fill those holes and it'll look a lot nicer when we paint it rather than having a bunch of screw holes. Then we laid that whole cabinet down on its face and we covered up the last two holes with some small pieces of half inch Baltic birch to complete the ensemble. And with that, all six, holy flippin' cow, of our upper shelving units were put together. But that doesn't mean that they were done. Now I specifically designed the upper portion of this cabinet so that I wouldn't have to do a traditional face frame because I thought doing a 14 foot wide by 17 foot tall face frame sounded insane. So I designed it so that all the shelves could be faced with the face pieces being perfectly flush with the outside plywood. Then once we got all the upper shelving units in place, we could run some central columns up to cover that exterior plywood and make the whole thing look finished. If that doesn't make any sense, don't worry, you'll see what I mean as we start to put this together. For now, all you have to know is that we needed to face all the internal shelves with some poplar. We did this by simply gluing, tacking to the front of that shelf, and sending a screw in through the outside to lock everything nice and securely. The only downside is because due to the size of this, we had to do that about 40 times to cover all of our shelves and our upper units that will hold some exterior lighting once we get the shelf all put together. And we are quickly running out of space in my shop. It was almost the end of day two. I felt pretty good with what we had accomplished. There was just one more thing we wanted to get done, and that was to get our oak top finished with a little Rubio Monocoat. I went for a combination of mud light and cotton white, and I really like the way this one turned out. Oh, hi. This video is sponsored by Squarespace. Now this is an easy one because I absolutely love Squarespace. Over my life, I've built quite a few websites. And the fact that I can even say that sentence, I built a website, is pretty impressive because I'm not a web designer. But that's what's awesome about Squarespace. They make it so easy that anybody can build a professional looking website for yourself, for your business, and it looks great. Let me show you. I'm gonna show you our website, Squarespace, and you'll see what I'm talking about here. All right, so this is our website. We actually just rebuilt it, and if you ask me, it's pretty darn sweet. The thing I love about Squarespace is it's mobile friendly. So it looks great on your computer, but it also looks great on your phone, because let's be honest, lots of people are gonna be visiting your website from their phone, so you want it to look good on both. And it looks great on your tablet. On our website, you can click on our goods page. Squarespace makes uploading new products crazy easy. You can set quantities, you can develop shipping profiles for each individual product. They make it super simple. And then if you're also selling digital content, if you go back to our homepage, well, you can click on our plans and these are all digital downloads. So they get sent to you via email and Squarespace does all that for me. I don't have to send each person that buys one of these an email. Squarespace just automatically emails it when they purchase a plan. There's an About Us page where you can learn a little bit more about me and how I got started. So many features. So if you're looking for an incredibly easy way to get a professional website, head to squarespace.com. You get a free trial, and when you're ready to launch, go to squarespace.com slash bourbonmothwoodworking, and you get 10% off your first purchase of a website or domain. Couldn't be easier. And also, go check out my website, Squarespace website. It's pretty Pretty cool. Day three. It was the morning of day three and we pretty much had all of the main pieces done for our built-in and we were ready to start actually putting them in place and making this cabinet look like something. Luckily, the area that we were installing it was only about 50 feet outside of my shop door. This is eventually gonna be my office space where I can edit videos and do voiceovers and have clients over and all that fun stuff. 
Oh yeah, I don't have clients anymore. I guess it's just a glorified man cave. Anyways, we carried all of our carcasses over to my man cave office. Just, if you talk to my wife, tell her it's an office. And we started getting our base cabinets in place. Now, as you can see, they're spaced out with a little plywood spacer in between each one. This is going to allow us to put a central column in between each cabinet and give the unit a more grandiose look, if you will. This is actually part of my master plan to not have to do a face frame on the top. Trust me, you'll understand as it all comes together. After getting all of our base units spaced out with those little plywood spacers, just held in with some pocket holes, we then centered the entire unit in the wall. Once it was perfectly centered with even spaces on either side, we made sure that it was nice and level and we secured it to the wall using those nailer strips on the back of the cabinet. Then we brought in some pieces of poplar to cover up our ugly plywood spacers. See how that makes this nice little column in between each cabinet? Doesn't that look good? And when we get to the top, that one key element is going to be what saves us from doing a traditional face frame. Just, just wait. It's pretty cool. To hold these poplar trim pieces in place, we just simply slathered them with glue and tacked them on with a 16 gauge brad nailer. Next, it was time to install our oak top. So we cut it to length and we carried that 14 footer, the 50 feet over to my office and we started trying to wiggle it into place. Now the room is 14 feet, one inches wide and the oak top is 14 feet, one inch wide. So you can imagine it's not the easiest thing to wrestle into place when you have to go all the way to the back of the room. Luckily, I'm kind of short and Keith's kind of tall, so I went low and he went high, and with a little shimmy, a little shake, and possibly a small hole in the drywall. Don't worry, we patched it. We eventually managed to get that thing sandwiched in between the two walls with a fit that was satisfactory even for Keith's high standards. With the oak top on top, we just hooked it to the base cabinets with a few inch and a quarter screws through our plywood braces on the top of our bottom cabinets, if that makes any sense. Now Keith had this brilliant idea that he said he uses sometimes when he installs cabinets, and that is to put these little furring strips on the back wall that span between studs. They're a half inch thick, That'll bump our cabinet out just a half inch, but what this does is makes it so that we can install screws anywhere we want on the back of the cabinet as long as we know the height of those strips. And we don't have to try and find studs, which can be challenging to do because studs aren't always where they're supposed to be. So after putting strips across our entire back wall for the lower cabinets, we brought in our first unit, Keith ate some chips, and I added on our little plywood spacers on the outside. Then we brought in our second unit. This one wanted to run into all the cooling tube thingamawatsits for my mini split. But with a little pulling and shaking, we got our second unit in place. Now these are the easy ones. At this point, we're at like normal built-in height. Nothing too crazy. We clamped that one to our first unit and we hooked them together with our little spacer strips of plywood and some pocket holes. No problem. Then we brought in our third unit. This one wasn't too bad either. You see, we set a blanket on our oak top because it was already finished and we didn't want to scratch it up and very carefully, we leaned our third unit into place. And once again, using those little plywood spacer strips, we hooked it to the middle cabinet with some pocket holes. Now here's where things got a little tricky. Because right now that cabinet is about 10 and a half, 11 feet tall. And we're still going up. We had to get a whole nother row of cabinets on top of that one. Now this first one really wasn't too bad. I mean, it wasn't fun, but it could have been worse. Because we were able to take two ladders and because it was in the middle, we could each be on the outside and just slowly walk up the ladders until we were able to set it on top of the lower cabinets and slide the whole thing into place. 
Now, it was at this point, after we already set it up there, that we realized we never added our furring strips on the upper portion of the back wall. Luckily, that middle cabinet was already spaced out a half inch because it was sitting on top of the lower ones, and we were able to slide strips in behind it and add strips on either side of it. But this is where things got really tricky, because unlike that middle unit, we weren't able to get on both sides of it with the ladder. So Keith kind of had a push from below, I pulled from above, we got it rested on the ladder, Keith climbed up, he held it in place, then apparently I decided to climb back down, I got underneath it, and I just deadlifted it. Straight up over my head while Keith kind of glided it into place. It wasn't fun, it wasn't very smart, I'm surprised they didn't throw my back out, but we got it up there. Now because that method worked so good on the right side, we for some reason decided to do something completely different on the other side. We both started at the bottom, and then had this moment of like, what now? And I quickly ran to the top of the ladder, and Keith kind of jump pushed, and then we both got ladders, and we kind of just, well, it got up there. None of it was pretty, but it got done and we were pretty tired at the end of day three. Day four. Day four came with a whole new set of challenges because although all of the heavy lifting was done, all of our shelving units were in place, we now had to try and make this entire thing look pretty by trimming it out. And if you know anything about installing cabinets, trim work, it's hard enough on a small cabinet, let alone one that is nearly 17 feet tall. And we're not even done going up. That comes later, after Keith apparently shakes his bottom. Now remember that one design element I said that eliminated the need for a traditional face frame on the top? Yeah, here it is. And it's pretty smart if I do say so myself, by making all of the shelf facing flush with the cabinet box and then hooking the boxes together with those little spacer pieces of plywood, it allowed us to put these central trim pieces that ran from the top of our base cabinets all the way up to the ceiling that were seamless and sat on top of the shelves, completely covering up our plywood and making the thing look, well, like it had a little more depth to it. Levels, Jerry, levels. Anyways, this plan was all well and good until it came to the outside trim pieces. Because those are always the tricky one because the wall is never straight. So Keith got on the ladder and drew the longest scribe line of his life. He then so kindly handed the board to me to cut to said scribe line. The first thing I did was grab a router and add a bevel on the back of the piece to reduce the amount of material that I had to cut through. Then I just grabbed my Rotex sander and used it to slowly sand right up to his scribed line. Now this sounds crazy, but it actually works pretty well and in my opinion is a lot cleaner than trying to cut it with a jigsaw. After cutting to that scribe line, we hauled it in place, crossed our fingers and prayed. And what do you know? For being a 13 foot piece, it fits pretty tight against each wall. Whew. What a relief. So with our outer two pieces scribed, we glued and tacked them in place and then there was just one more big piece of trim and that was this giant board that was gonna sit on top of everything all the way up in the rafters and give us a nice surface to mount some lighting on in the form of brass sconces. But those aren't going up until after the whole thing's painted and the video's gonna be over long before that, so. I really don't know why I'm telling you. What I should be telling you is we got that securely in place with some glue and some brad nails. And it looked pretty darn good. But we were not done going up yet. Now I thought the perfect cap for this giant set of built-ins would be this bumped out soffit-like structure that would match the ceiling. Now I wanted to layer this with one and a half inch thick tongue and groove pine because that's what was on the roof. And I wanted it all to match and be cohesive. 
Now we probably should have done this before the built-ins so that we could have got behind there and attached all the pieces and just slid the built-ins in underneath. But I didn't think about it until after the built-ins. So we're just gonna have to figure out a way to make this work. It was pretty easy because I was able to reach behind the rafters and screw all the pieces in from the backside until we got up to a certain height. Then I actually had to climb back there while Keith handed me pieces and I screwed them in from the backside. I know what you're thinking. There's cabinets below and you are currently entombing yourself in a little soffit structure. How the heck are you gonna get out? Well, I'm glad you asked. After thoroughly entombing myself back in the apex of my roof, I then cut a hole through the top of the cabinet using a multi-tool that I always carry in my back pocket. Then all I had to do was kick through the top of that cabinet and squeeze my way out. And then all we would need to do was cover up that hole with a thin piece of quarter inch birch plywood glued in place and nobody would be the wiser. But the entirety of this grand plan hinged on one thing, actually being able to get out from behind there. That'll work. Day five. Hey, remember those lights I told you about that you're not going to see because the video is going to end before we ever get to that? Well, here's me drilling out the holes and installing the electrical boxes for said lights. That was the beginning of day five. Then all we really had to do was get all of our drawer boxes made, get all of our drawer boxes installed, and all of our drawer fronts hooked on. So we started making drawer boxes. Now we started making these the same way I pretty much make all of my drawer boxes, and that's just with some half inch Baltic birch milled down to whatever width you need for your drawer box. We carve out a quarter inch groove in the bottom to hold our panel. I cut all the pieces to length, Keith took them over to the drum sander and sanded them on both sides until they were smoother than his unshaved face. And then I started assembling all of the boxes with glue and 16 gauge brad nails. They don't have to be pretty, they just have to be functional. They are for my own shop, studio, man cave. In no time we had 18 drawer boxes put together. Ah, I knew Keith was back there somewhere. And we went out to the built-in to start installing drawer slides. Now, I wanted to use Bloom undermount drawer slides, but you can't get them anywhere right now. So I had to get a knockoff brand on Amazon. They were subpar, but I think they're going to work. While I was installing drawer slides, Keith was installing the clips onto the bottom of each drawer. He would then bring me some drawers, and I would slide them into place. But somewhere along there, he must have got tired of walking the 50 feet out to the built-in because he called on the foreman to carry all of his drawers for him. And he did a pretty good job and was fairly excited to help out. So excited that he did the floss and raised the roof. And then did one more raise the roof just for good measure. Because it was our last day and we dinked around and took it pretty slow, it was nighttime by the time we got around to installing our drawer faces and because there's no power hooked up in this space yet, we had to install our drawer faces by the light of an LED work lamp. But we managed to get them all hooked in place. We had pre-drilled for all of our hardware so we just used those pre-drilled holes and some screws to attach everything. and. We were done. Four and a half days later, we had a 14 foot wide and 25 foot tall built-in. Yikes. Well, there you have it. An entire built-in shelving unit in less than a week. Pretty crazy. We worked hard on this one. I mean, like late nights, early mornings, not a lot of fun. But we got it done. I already started taking off all the drawer faces to get this thing prepped and ready for painting. Like I said in the video, I'm gonna have a painter come in and do this because I don't want no part of that. 
So I hope you guys enjoyed that video. Check the video description below for links to all of the products that you saw us use in this video, as well as a link to our Patreon page. And there's a link down there to Keith's video. He's doing a whole video on the same build, and you're definitely gonna wanna check it out just to make sure I'm telling the truth and his side of the story is the same. Plus, he's better at making videos than me. So go over, watch the video on his channel, and make sure you subscribe. Oh, that's a hard pass.